yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rap his bed. With the church a few times, now nuts trying to get me head. Ah, you took the exam, so it's good. All right, so today we're going to talk about code generation or query compilation. Uh, query compilation, code generation. I'll, I'll say, you, you'll see what I mean as we go along, but it's, uh, this, this term is, there's not like one specific term that mean exactly everything we're talking about. But it's basically how to take a SQL query, convert it to a query plan, and then generate machine code or something that can execute directly that uh, query plan instead of having to interpret it. Uh, for, for you guys and the, you know, for things that are, that are due, Project one is due uh, this Sunday coming up. Wayne sent a reminder on Piazza that you should, you should do it. Um, project uh, two has been uh, released yesterday or this weekend. I'll talk more about it on, uh, on Friday, or sorry, on Wednesday's class. That's basically just writing up a, a sort of encyclopedia article about a particular database system. And then what I need to do is I need to go through and look at the sort of existing systems that we have and pull, and, you know, Come up with a list, a curated list of like which ones that you guys can can do, because um, some of them are already already pretty already fleshed out. Like the Postgres one is pretty well written. Uh, potentially same thing with Redshift and other ones. So I'm not, I don't want to pick ones that are germane to the to, to the topics in the course. Project three, uh, I'll post the the write up on um, on the website tonight. Uh, but the proposals for the class will be in class next next Wednesday on the first, um, and there'll be updates. And the final presentation will be during finals week. Yes. Yeah, so like I'll discuss it in this lecture, like seed ideas. But, we have to give a proposal by May first. Yes, but it's like five minutes. Like, hey, here's what I think we're gonna do. Okay. Just like the plan of flags. Like, I, I, I know what. At least, you know, am I on the right path to get started? Um, again, the challenge is we're not building a, our own database system anymore at Carnegie Mellon. So like, we don't have a f full system that everyone can work on. And I can just carve off different pieces that we've done in previous years in 721. So everything we're going to do is either be Postgres or DuckDB or really any other system that we have. But I mean, the, the project will be, will, will be, um, will be uh, disconnected for the most part from each other or isolated from each other. Um, again, reading the hyper papers again, and the Umbra papers and the Germans, you know, I, I miss building a system here at CMU, but just it's, it's not our sort of main priority right now. OK, all right, so again, we'll cover uh, Project 3 topics at the end of this class. And I'm happy to discuss in my office hours if there's additional things you guys are interested in exploring and want help and how to get started on all that. All right, so last class, we spent time talking how to, how to vectorize the sort of the, the, the basic algorithms in a database system to optimize them to, by taking advantage of SIMD. And this is an example of intro query parallelism right, within a single CPU. Can we operate on multiple data items in, in parallel? And if we can do this across all the cores at the same time that are running our query, we get a pretty significant uh, speed up, potentially. Um, of course, th there is you know, challenges of getting the data in and out of the, CP the SIMD registers. So if you read the hyper paper and uh, a bunch of papers around 2014, 2013, 2015, um, there's sort of seemed like there are these two camps of, in the research literature that talk about either vectorization or just-in-time compilation, as if they're, they're mutually exclusive. You couldn't do one, you couldn't do both of them together. You either build a system that did one, or you build a system that, that did other. Um, and that, sort of say up front, like, that's not the case, and may, maybe that was talked about a little bit in the hyper paper. Um, we'll see next class a comparison to these two approaches, but when we talked about in, in our old system we were building a CMU, we could do that relaxed operator fusion, we could do the SIMD and, and compilation together. So I don't want to give the impression that, that you have to pick one or the other, some, some of the modern systems will do, uh, or pretty much all the modern OLAP systems will choose vectorization, and then some will do some light, no, light's not the right word, but some partial compilation, just for like the expressions, and then some systems will do the holistic query compilation. But in today's class, we're just focused entirely on just how you just compile queries and not worry about uh, the vector, vectorization stuff. And then next, next class, we'll, we'll compare the two approaches in a single system. And so this is just a reminder again why we're all doing, why we're doing this. Right? Our goal is to, you know, if our goal is to make the database system run faster, the three approaches are to, to reduce the number of instructions we execute, reduce the number of cycles per instruction, and maximize, uh, or maximize the amount of parallelism we have across multiple threads and multiple workers. And this is, again, you do this after you've already done your zone maps or your filters, your indexes to remove as much data as possible. So this is for the data you do have to access, that you do have to, uh, to analyze 
uh, you know, how to cut down the execution cost of that. So in today's class, we're going to mostly focus on this one here. Right? We're going to use compilation as a technique to reduce the instruction count for, for, for all the operators in our database system because instead of having to uh, interpret the query plan and interpret the data as we access it, just think of these giant switch statements that says, if my data type is this, do this, if that, do that, right? We can basically hard code an exact uh, program that knows exactly what the data looks like, knows exactly what the size of that data is, and what we want to do on it. And we can do this because in SQL, everything's declarative. We know what the, the data is ahead of time. So to give you an idea of how hard this actually is, this is a, uh, this, this quote, these quotes here are from uh, a paper written by Microsoft in 2011. Uh, about how they, why they chose to do query compilation or code specialization in the Hecaton system that they were building. We're not going to cover Hecaton in this class, but it was basically, or it is a uh, in-memory execution engine for SQL Server that allowed you to do like fast transactions. But they, they wanted to reduce the execution time of transactions because then you spend less time holding locks and latches. So they built a code compilation engine for Hecaton. So if you just do, so the back of the envelope calculations, you say, if I want to reduce my instruction count to execute queries, if I want to get 10x faster, then I have to execute 90% fewer queries, or fewer instructions. All right? That's, and then again, code compilation, we can do that. Uh, but if you want to get now 100x faster, like two orders of magnitude, now we're going to execute 99% fewer instructions. And that's where this thing actually gets really, really hard. Right? There's no magic like 0100 flag in GCC to compile away like everything. Right? So again, it's, I don't want to get the impression that it's just reducing the number of instructions entirely, and that's the only goal. We're going to care about getting, you know, the, the number of instructions per cycle, but the way we'll be able to achieve that, in addition to, or the, the byproduct of doing code specialization and reducing the number of instructions, we can be smart about what data those instructions are accessing to help us reduce the number of cycles per instruction. All right, so today we'll talk off, start off talking about sort of background of what code specialization generation is. Um, then we'll talk about transpilation or the code generation approach from the Haiku paper, which is the precursor to the hyper paper that you guys read. It's basically source to source compilation. How do I take C++ code and have it generate C++ code? The JIT compilation paper in the hyper work, uh, this is about taking, uh, having the C++ code, or whatever the data system is written in, and generating some intermediate representation like the LLVM IR, or you know, we'll see in SQLite, they, they have their own opcodes or bytecodes. Right, and then compiling that. And then we'll go through sort of a quick sort of you know, buffet of here's all the systems that I'm aware of that are doing, the, the notable systems that are doing, uh, you know, doing this code specialization approach. And you'll see again that how some ideas are reused from one system to the next and other, other systems could take a completely, complete, completely different approach. And then as I said, if we finish up, we'll have time, we'll go over some uh, potential Project 3 topics, right? So again, the paper you guys read for the JIT compilation, that's using LLVM. Uh, the reason why you guys had you read that paper, because it came out, I think, in 2011. And that's, it wasn't the first paper in the modern era to do code specialization in a database system. Um, and it's you know, definitely not an easy read. Uh, hopefully, nobody needs to spend a lot of time reading the, like, there's the LLVM IR stuff in the, in the, in the appendix. Like, I should have told you not to read that. But it, um, it is the first system that, that's doing this approach and then a bunch of systems are, are, doing, are doing something very similar after that. There's systems based on the JVM. Again, they're generating bytecode, and the JVM can interpret that. And that's, again, at a high level, it's the same thing. All right, so as I said, we want to reduce the number of instructions we have for while we execute queries. The way we can achieve this is through uh, code specialization. Vectorization is one approach, can, to, but this is, this is like now, is it, again, they're not mutually exclusive. This is another way to, to do, achieve this. So the basic and higher level idea is that instead of having, uh, instead of having this, this general purpose code in the database system that can handle all possible variations of predicates, data types, aggregations for, for any possible query that shows up, for every query that does show up, we want to generate exactly the execution code to do that, what that, exactly that query wants to do. And we can do this again because it's SQL, everything is declarative. It's not like people are submitting us arbitrary Python programs or arbitrary C code, right? It's we know exactly what we want to execute and we can generate the code to do exactly uh, what is needed, right? 
And we can do this uh, for, again, the, the main benefit will be for different data types and then the different operands we have to execute in expression tree. And this is going to reduce the number of function calls and number of jumps, uh, amount of indirection in, in our code path. So the reason why people, we have to do this is because, well, I mean, because why well, this is going to matter so much for us is because the, the way people normally would write code is often not the best way for, again, for, that, for the CPU to execute it. I've said this multiple times before, but this is especially true when it comes to this, this type of stuff, right? Because people want to build database systems where their you know, pieces of code are modular or reusable. Um, you, know, you have this uh, inheritance property or, or paradigm in, in, in your implementation, but that's the worst possible thing for, for a CPU because it wants long sequential uh, op uh, instructions in order without any indirection. And code specialization will, will avoid all this. So to go run an example for this, for this class, I'm going to show a, assume we have a database of three tables, A, B, and C. A and B have a primary key, uh, and then C has uh, the, the has foreign key references to A and B, and that's the primary key. Right? So this will, again, be the running example going forward for, for a bunch of, for when we talk about how to do code specialization. Uh, let's say we have a query like this, where we have a join in A and C, and then also an inner query on, on B that's doing some kind of aggregation. So a rough approximation of a query plan for this, for this query would be something like this. And the, assuming we're going with the volcano model, the iterator model, it, for each of these oper operators in our query tree, the code would look roughly like this, like some, some kind of pseudo, pseudo uh, Python code. So now, if, again, I'm going from, from, from the top to the bottom, if, you know, the, in the top plan, I call next that goes down to this side. This calls next on the right side and goes down. I'm just calling next, next, and next. All these are function calls. And then within each, uh, uh, in, within each of these operators, it's going to have this, these lookup tables and say, well, the, my table looks like this, or my input tuple is going to have this schema. Therefore, I'll allocate a hash table that has this size. So I can store this you know, data that looks like this. Then when I'm doing these comparisons, again, same thing. I have to do these giant lookup tables and say, my, my data on my right side is this. My data on my left side is that. Here's how to comp compare two integers or compare an integer and a float. All right? So, so there's, again, if you look at, like, in, in, in any open source database system that's not doing code specialization, you'll see these giant switch statements that says, if the right side is this and the right side is that, here's how to cast it into the right type and, and do, the, do the comparison. Do whatever the operation I want to do. So... So there's, a lot of, so there's a lot of general purpose code here to traverse this tree. Uh, but then again, now within the, the predicates themselves, they're going to be expensive because, as I was saying, now you have to have these giant trees to traverse this and do, to actually do whatever the predicate says it wants to do. So here we have b.val equals question mark plus one. Question mark is a placeholder for, uh, for prepared statements, sometimes like dollar sign one, dollar sign two. The, the, the idea is like it's a prepared statement. It'll be provided at runtime as if it was a function call. So a approximate res representation just for this one predicate would be a tree like this. And now for, as I'm scanning the table, in the, the B table here, for every single tuple, I have to traverse this tree and produce the result to see whether it evaluates it true or not. So I would start at the root, go down the right side, or the left side, and I have an attribute here. So then now I've got to go look up in the table schema um, and figure out, okay, if I, it's b.val, it's for then this tuple, the first, I want the first attribute, it's an integer. So I know it's going to be this size, and I can then shove that up to uh, as, as the output of this. Then I go down the, this side. I see the plus operator. I know I need to go down the left side here, so I'm going to end up on this thing. This is asking for the parameter that was in, input for the prepared statement. So again, then I got to go look up my query parameter context that's being passed around for every single tuple. This is produces 99. Come over here, constant one, gives me one. Then I go back, add it together, and then the values are true. So I'm doing a depth-first search or depth-first traversal of this tree for every single tuple. And every single time I go from one operator to the next, it's going to be another function call. That means another jump in my instructions. And then, you know, in this case here, there's no conditional. You, we, well, this would have, well, yeah, you would always have conditional. Um, in this case here, the, the, the CPU could execute these in order. But if I have, a, you know, if I have a bunch of conjunctions, and sometimes I can do short-circuiting and not go down a branch, I might, I might mispredict that. I can always think of an extreme. So if I have a billion tuples, then I'm doing one billion traversals for every single tuple just for this where clause. And that's just for evaluating this one predicate. So the goal of code specialization is to remove all of this. That we want to be able to just say exactly, I know what the predicate is, or 
here's exactly the steps I need to do to, to, to apply whatever my check is. So the idea at high level, we're going to be able to identify different parts of the system that we know are going to be CPU intensive and are going to be, have the re same repeated behavior, just with different inputs. And then the idea is then be able to extract that out uh, and generate that on the fly or have that existing uh, cache version of it that I can like, sort of substitute and stitch in. And then that becomes my query execution rather than having to traverse the tree and do all these lookups. So the most common one is going to be predicate evaluation, like where clauses. Postgres does this, ClickHouse does this. And then the hyperpaper, they're, at, they're doing what's called holistic query compilation, where you're, you're compiling all the query, including all parts of the query, including the, um, in, including the, 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 the predicates themselves. So access methods and store procedures. Store procedures, as far as I know, only, um, or UDS, only Oracle does this. Um, query operators, again, that's the hyper approach. Logging operations, this would be like if I'm, if I have to replay the log, and instead of having uh, to interpret what the log entry is, if I can, if I can hard code or bake a program, and it's exactly like, okay, here's the update on this table, it has this format, that I can accelerate replay. As far as I know, nobody does this outside the research literature. So just again, going back, you know, well, how to do predicate evaluation, it's not the exact query I had before, but a really simple example would be, I have a where clause where val equals one, I have my tree where it equals, and, at, and then the attribute and the constant, and then I want to basically generate a function that takes in some value and then returns true if it equals one. This again, this is super high level, but this is the goal. We want to generate machine code that does this, so we don't have to tra traverse the tree. Now, there also, there, one is important thing to point out is that there's not going to be any security, security concerns in what we're doing here because, again, we're not taking arbitrary code from outside, you know, from outside the database system. The database system is the one that's actually generating this code. So we have to be careful and make sure we don't clobber memory and, and break things, but we don't have to worry about some, like, you know, some query showing up and then us injecting code or writing code that then you know, does Bitcoin mining or something like that. Right? It's, it's the data system wants to generate this code, so we, we trust ourselves not to write stupid, stupid things or, or malicious things. So we don't care that, yes, it's arbitrary C that we're linking to the system because we're not going to go try to shoot ourselves in the face. Right? And we'll, see, we'll see in the case of, uh, in, uh, in some systems where they support, you can write store procedure to UDS in C, which could be malicious. They'll run that in a sandbox at a separate process. So you can't access the memory of, of the database system. So Oracle does that. Postgres, does, Postgres lets you write functions in C, but they don't run it in the sandbox, as far as I know. All right, so there's gonna be two ways to do this. There's transpilation or source-to-source source source compilation, and then the JIT compilation from the hyperpaper. So again, the first one is we wanna have a, our, our, our database system itself, like say it's written in C++, it's gonna generate C++ code for the query or the predicate we're trying to evaluate, and then we just go ahead and use a conventional compiler and then to generate a shared object, link that in, and we invoke that. The JIT compilations, I said, the idea is that we want to generate some kind of IR, intermediate representation, either the LLVM representation or uh, some opcode or bytecodes that, that we've, we've defined, and then the data system can either interpret that bytecode or then pass it along to, the, to LLVM or whatever compiler you want to then compile that uh, directly. So what this looks like in, in the sort of the, the stack of the database system is that we're going to do all of this after, the, uh, after we get the physical plan from the query optimizer. So the SQL query shows up, we parse it, uh, and we put it into an abstract syntax tree. Then we run it through the binder, or the mapper, sometimes it's called, where we do lookups in the catalog and map like string names of a table to the actual table object ID, or a column ID, or get the type. Then we have this annotate, annotated S AST. Uh, sometimes some systems, well, this will be actually be a logical plan, uh, but we can ignore that for now. Then we have some query optimizer, assuming it's cost-based, we have a cost estimate. We can do is look up in the catalogs to figure out types and try to figure out what the best physical plan is. And then we take that physical plan and then generate the, uh, the compiled version of it, right? Because the idea is, again, I, I, the optimizer says, if here's the hash join, you know, for this query, you should be doing a hash join. So the compiler can then say, okay, here's the hash join uh, machine code for it, right? And then we can go ahead and, and, and natively execute that. This is a gross approximation. This, we'll see in a second or later on how like in hyper, uh, the, the, 
the optimizer will spit out a physical plan, and then it'll generate sort of one pass will generate like these bytecodes. Then in the background, they'll use the LLVM and compile it, and then substitute it. Again, for, but the main thing I want to point out is we're doing this after we get the physical plan. All right, so I'm going to go through an example of uh, one of the first examples of doing uh, transpilation or source to source compilation, um, and then we'll focus on how Hyper does it. Again, both the newer version, the original version that you guys read, and, the, and a newer version. All right, so one of the first prototype systems in the modern era, and again, by modern era, I mean like 2010, like the, the late 2000s, early, early 2010s. As, I, I might have said this already, but as, as, as often the case in database systems, IBM actually did this code generation stuff back in the 1970s. They did it first, but then they threw it away, they abandoned it in the 80s, and then now it's back in vogue because everyone's trying to get, get reduce this instruction count. So I'm saying again, so Haiku was the first in the modern era. So again, they're doing source to source compilation. So query shows up, and then the data system will generate a C++ program that implements exactly what that query wants to execute. Right? And you're going to bake in all the, the, the type evaluation, the predicates, and so forth. There, there are no external, like, there's no function lookups to do interpretation to say what the data type is. It does exactly what you need. You're, if you're operating on 32-bit integers, it makes instructions for 32-bit integers, and again, in C++. And then they're just going to use an off-the-shelf compiler. I think they're using GCC. Then convert the, the code into a shared object. You link it into the database process uh, and execute it. The way this works is the, the, the program you're generating has to have a, an entry point, like a main function, but not exactly, an entry point that, the, that it generates with a certain uh, uh, Function signature, input signature, arguments, and then the uh, the data system knows how to then invoke that function in the shared object, right? Relying on the the, the sort of ELF format uh, in Linux or whatever, whatever the operating system is using, right? So we're not it's not like we're we're running the data system and then we make a fork exec call to this this program that can run a query. We're linking it in and then calling it directly in memory. But in the case of the compiler, that one we have to fork exec. We have to call that as an external, uh, you know, ex external process to compile it, like running GCC. Of course, that's going to be expensive now because what does GCC do when you, when you start compiling something? Well, it starts looking for its own config files, it parses them to figure out what it can do. Right, so so it, this is a pretty heavy weight way of generating machine code here. All right, so let's see how they're going to generate operator templates. And again, the idea is that we're going to uh, convert the query plan into this templated code that we then can compile and then substitute at runtime whatever the values actually are for any tuple we're looking at or any parameter that's passed in. So we say we have a simple query, select star from A, where a.val equals uh, input argument plus one. So in the interpreted plan, it's basically exactly as you looked at before. Again, this is like pseudo Python code, where I'm going to iterate over all the tuples, uh, all, for the number of tuples I have in my table. Uh, first step is going to get that tuple. And so in this part here, what is actually going to happen in the code is that you've got to go look up in the catalog and say, what's the schema of, of the tuple I'm looking at? And this is what you, you can cache, right? Because usually the catalog's in the database system itself, or it's like a remote service, like the Hive Metastore. So for that one, you don't want to do a look up every single tuple. You can cache that, but still you have to go do it at some point. And then you've got to figure out, all right, what's the offset in the table I'm, I need to look at based on the size? And then, again, and then return back a pointer to, to that tuple. And then to evaluate like the predicate, I got to traverse that expression tree that we saw before, pull up the values, and produce, you know, pr produce whatever the result is, and then have, make a determination uh, based on whether the predicate value is the true, decide where to go. Again, so this is, you know, I'm doing this for every single tuple. Think in, think in extremes, the billion tuples. So, you know, I'll have this cache, the, these, the catalog will be cached, but this is bit, very expensive to do. And so instead, you can generate a program. Again, I'm showing Python, but it's in C++, where you have these, these, these values that we passed in at runtime. Like, what's the size of the tuple? So you know how to jump to the right offset. Uh, what's the predicate? Uh, what's the offset of the predicate I want to do an evaluation for? And what's the parameter I'm, I'm, I'm doing my comparison with? And so in this case here, I can just bake in all of this code. And then now, when, when I execute it, I'm just filling in these parameters, and then the instead of having an expression tree, now it really is just like, what is the parameter value plus one? Is that equal to the thing I'm, look, I'm looking for? And that's my example where I was going to be able to convert this tr expression tree into a single one-line instruction to do the comparison. All right? 
So there's still going to be some, uh, some branching because of this if clause, and we saw how to do branchless scans before. Uh, you, you could substitute, substitute that and replace that. The main thing here is that I don't, have to, I don't have to traverse that expression tree every single time. So the generated code can evoke any other part of the database system. Uh, it's like as if I was the programmer building the system and I just wrote, you know, uh, made a new, new files that could then get all compiled together in my data system when I generate the, 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 the system binary. Uh, because I'm going to be running in the same address space, I can call any other part of the system. Uh, and that allows you to, again, to take advantage of all the built-in functionality the system comes with without having to write it from scratch or using some kind of interconnect or IPC to send messages back and forth. So if I need to allocate memory that, uh, uh, that I want to store in the buffer pool, I can just have my, my query, my generated query code, make calls to the buffer pool manager. Or I need to send things over the network or read something from disk. I can reuse all of that code. The other advantage you get also too with this approach is that debugging is relatively easy. I'm saying relatively compared against the LLVM stuff, which is actually a nightmare. Uh, and we'll see why in a second. Um, because it's just C++ code, if there's a bug in it and it crashes, I can go back and compile it and, and walk through my debugger and figure out what's going on. I have to do a little extra work to figure out, to, to, to maybe keep track of what C++ code generated that C++ code, because uh, I want to know, because I can't just fix the program because that doesn't help me. I want to fix the thing that generated the program. So there is some extra work you got to do to figure out where to go find in the system code that generated that, that, that code that crashed, but at least when you debug the crash query, you would understand why, because you can, you can walk through the generated source code. All right? And all the nice de debugger tools you would have for the regular system development are available to the compiled query. Again, th then, and that's going to be a problem with the LLVM when we do just-time compilation. All right? So to understand the, you know, how much better this is, uh, well, what, I, what, what I like about this paper is they compare against the a bunch of different variations of, of how someone could build a database system with their approach. You see the actual true performance benefits that you get through uh, code generation. So Haiku, it, it was a, again, it was an academic prototype. It was, uh, it was a column store. I think everything was in memory. Um, and they, they're, they're going to process their, like a, you know, a single table, a sing, single set of queries at a time. So the first one would be the sort of the, you know, 445, 645 implementation of a bare bones or basic volcano style query engine with generic predicate evaluations traversing a tree. Then you have a uh, optimized version of it where instead of having the, you know, a switch statement says what's the data type, you would have a, a, an iterator for, um, for integer columns or, or floating point columns. Right? It was at least specialized in some way. Then you had a generic hard coded version uh, where it was handwritten, but it was, it was sort of optimized for what the query could actually be. And then you have, and this, like, this is what a, like a grad student could write. Then you have an optimized version of that, and then you have their uh, query specific, uh, you know, the, 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 their system generating the code. So in this here, you're showing the total execution time of the system, but they're going to break it down between how much time is being sent for actually executing uh, instructions versus stalling because of memory uh, lookups, and then stalling because of, of L2. They also measure L1 misses, but like they're so, you know, sm so small compared to the other ones that it's nothing worth looking at, right? And so obviously the generic one is slow, and this is a simple join query on a, on a small table. Again, this is back in 2008, so like it's running on a core, core two duo. It's a pretty obsolete uh, CPU, but it's, it's the relative difference is what I care about. And so the main thing to point out here is that the sort of the, the grad student optimized handwritten version of the query plan uh, is, is a little bit slower, but basically the same thing as what Haiku could generate. So Haiku could, the, the data system could generate code as good, if not better, than what a human could actually write and try to optimize, right? And whereas all this other stuff, again, because it's not specialized, because there's, there's, uh, you know, there's these traversals of the trees and so forth, that's why things are slower. So this sounds fantastic, right? This says, okay, well, I can have my data system generate code as, as well as like, you know, a hardcore engineer could write by hand. What's the problem? Compilation. Bingo, compilation time, yes. So this GCC thing doesn't come for free. Uh, and so I don't have the numbers, because the paper doesn't really show, 
I don't have the numbers of like what's the performance of the of the, of the query for these two uh, approaches. Um, but if you just look at the compilation time, right, you can see obviously running without any comp you know, optimization pass with O0, it's uh, two to three x uh, faster than running with O2. And again, I said you don't ship database binaries, well, any system software with O3 because there's no guarantee that like things won't end up you know, in a funky state and you could crash. Um, and you, you don't typically ship O2 unless, well, if you're, if you're in the cloud, you could run O2 or O0 because you want to maybe step through with the debugger. But like if you're running on-prem, you don't ship anybody with O1 unless you're trying to like debug some funky crash. Right? So O2 is typically what you go at. But again, with O2, uh, the queries could be run faster, but now you're paying up to, in the case of Q10 and TPCH, uh, you know, 600 milliseconds to compile the query. And so if the query is going to run for like five hours, then who cares, 600 milliseconds. But if the query is going to run for like, for like 50 milliseconds, then, then if I'm spending 600 milliseconds to compile it, it's not a good trade-off. Right? So that, that's going to be a problem. The hyperpaper you're going to read also has this problem. We'll, we'll see how to solve this uh, afterwards. OK? All right. So as I said before, the, the Haiku has to fork GCC, has to allocate, which, again, it's a full process. It has to allocate its own memory, it has to reconfiguration files, and then shut itself down. Like, that's not cheap. Um, and so what we want to be able to do is uh, we want to be able to streamline this process so that we don't have to compile stuff or use an external program to compile things. We don't want to generate this stuff directly inside of our database system. There's other issues, too, like Haiku didn't support full pipelining, and we'll see. Again, this is the, the, the push-based approach. The, the hyper paper has two major contributions, is the push stuff and the compilation. It's hard to separate the two. I'm oh, sorry, I take that back. The paper, you have to sort of read both. Or sorry, they're both in there. You can't just, like, just read the compilation stuff because it's all intertwined. And this is why I was saying like, people have maybe had the impression that you couldn't do vectorization and compilation at the same time within one single system because if you read this paper, it seems you only can do the data-centric operator fusion stuff that, that Thomas is talking about. But again, it's not the case. All right, so with Hyper, what they were going to do is they're going to pile a query into native code using LLVM. Does everyone know what LLVM is or no? Well, I know you know. Okay. Does everyone here not know what LLVM is? All right, cool. I'm going to skip that. All right, perfect. So what they're going to do is they're going to use LLVM, and, and instead of emitting C++ code, they're going to have a bunch of these, these C++ macros that will spit out LLVM IR, and they basically stitch these things together and then hand that off to the LLVM uh, compiler to, to generate the x86 machine code or whatever the platform is. They're also going to do this, this operator uh, this fusion, not function, operator fusion within the pipelines so that the goal is to be able to keep uh, data in CPU registers for as long as possible going up the pipeline. Again, they claim in the paper because they're doing uh, code generation and query compilation and having exact control of how the, you know, the LLM IR is allocating data and, and registers, you're, you're more likely to achieve that when you actually run the code. You, you can do this without having to do uh, the, 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 the operator fusion stuff that I talked about. Again, we, we've talked about that before, but that, that, that's sort of the main idea. So if we go back to that query plan we had before, right, the, you know, we say these are our pipelines, right? So in this side here, on the left side, we're going to scan A and then do the filter, populate a hash join, and then we execute all these other ones. Um, and again, the pipelines are defined by pipeline breakers. These are not something that, uh, it's not hard to figure these things out. So this is why you, you do this, this code generation stuff after you have the physical plan, because the physical plan will tell you, essentially, here's the, here's, here's the simple heuristic, say here's where the pipeline breakers are, uh, and then you can then convert that into to the appropriate program. Right? So now, the, the push-based fused program that, rep that represents this query will look something like this. Again, if you think of these, each of these for loops is another pipeline. So I'm just generating all these programs, these for loops after each, after each other, and now I just call this one thing as if it was a single function and, go, and goes and fires it off, right? And so what will happen is in this first pipeline here, it's going to generate, uh, after it does the filter, it, put, it materializes the hash table that then can be used later on for, for this pipeline down here. Same thing with this one. It's going to do the aggregation in this hash table that's fed through here. And then it does the uh, you know, materialize that hash table and does the join down. Right? 
So again, this is doing the, the push-based operator fusion, where again, the, the, starting at the, the, the leaf nodes of, of the query plan, like the, they're pushing tuples up as far as they can in the pipeline. All right. OK. So now we can do a comparison in the paper of like how their approach with, uh, with you know, query compilation compares against what uh, some other well-known systems at the time. This is, like, this is 2011, so these are, like, these, these, you know, these are state-of-the-art OLAP systems at the time. And so for Hyper, they're going to have two versions of it. They're going to have their, the LLVM version and then a, and, a, and a previous version that was doing something like Haiku, where it was like handwritten C++ uh, operators. So the, the main thing to point out here is the red bar is always hyper with the LLVM. I think they're including the compilation time of these. Uh, and even then, it's still faster. And Oracle is just getting crushed here because it's a row store. It's not doing any code specialization. Vectorwise, we'll see in a second what they do. Uh, they're, instead of compiling on the fly, they're actually going to pre-compile all the predicates in your query, like when you actually compile the, the database binary itself. And then at runtime, they're going to just make function calls into them. So it's like it's, it is code specialization, but not just in time. It's sort of done. Uh, it's done when the system you know, initially starts up. And then uh, MonetDB didn't do code specialization. Uh, they had they 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 did what like SQLite does, where they had uh, it, they would generate opcodes for the query plan, and then they had an interpreter for those opcodes. Right. All right, so uh, of course they're gonna have the same problem where compilation cost is gonna is gonna is gonna dominate a lot of these queries, right? So th this is not exactly an apples to apples comparison because I'm combining results from the hyper paper, which is a newer CPU in 2011, from the Haiku paper uh, that was that that that, was, that preceded it. Uh, I think the hyper paper is on a Xeon early Xeon. This one's running on, on Haiku was running on, on a Core 2 Duo, um, but. The, the main takeaway, again, is that the, if you have to fork GCC, the compilation time is, is, is super expensive. Right? So Q1 go from 274 milliseconds down to 13. Because right? you're not, everything's in memory. You can't control in LLVM what optimization passes you want to do. Uh, so you can have more fine-grained control exactly what the compilation time is going to take. Right? But for these queries, they're relatively simple. And so you know, 37 milliseconds. Uh, is, you know, it's how it says, it's a, it is actually a lot, but for this particular query, it isn't that much. All right, so Q2 would be hyper, they can run it in 125 milliseconds, um, but the compilation time is 37 milliseconds. So that's, that's a sizable percentage. But again, if, I, if, I, if it's a scale factor 100, if the compilation time is 37 milliseconds and the query takes 20 seconds, then that's fine. So, in a subsequent hyper paper that came out, I think 2018, they talk about how again this compilation cost actually becomes a, becomes very dominant uh, for queries that actually don't read a lot of data. But if the query itself is very complex, then the compilation cost it grows super linearly. So it depends on the number of joins you have, the number of predicates, the number of aggregations, especially the number of pipelines you're, you're going to generate. Each of those is going to have a, a, a contribute to the compilation cost of the system. So again, if a query takes 30 seconds, if it takes one second to compile, who cares? But if a query could take five milliseconds and it takes 50 milliseconds to compile, then that's a problem. And I don't, I don't know if this is in the paper. This is what they told me that like they hit this problem uh, in particular when Hyper got bought by um, by by Tableau. They were you know they were trying to be Postgres compatible, so they found people hooking up this tool called PG Admin, which is basically a, a GUI interface to, to looking at your tables and, and, and your table schema or interacting with the Postgres database instead of the command line GUI. And when you start PG Admin, the very first, first thing it does is it does a bunch of queries against the catalog, PG catalog, it looks in the database and says, what are the tables I have, what columns I have. And the query itself doesn't read that much data, but it has a lot of joins between the different catalog tables. And it would take like 10 seconds to, to complete one of these queries because all the time is being spent during compilation. So with regular Postgres, you'd use PG Admin, turn them on, and immediately boots up, and you can see all your information. If you hooked it up to Hyper, it would take like 10, 20 seconds to start up. It would be this long pause. And people are like, is it broken? What's going on? No, because it's spending all its time doing compilation. For OTP applications, this is not a big problem, because most OTP applications will be executing with stored procedures, or sorry, prepared statements. So you see the same query over and over again, just with different input parameters. 
and therefore the you compile it once and you're done with it. Redshift will, will achieve basically the same thing by using a large uh, compiled query cache. But in the hyper world, they didn't you know they don't have uh, every time it's always a cold start. You don't have the existing cache, uh, and because they're compiling the entire query, so if you don't you've never seen that query before, you couldn't cache it anyway. So this is going to be a big problem for them. So the way they're going to handle it is, is, again, it was a subsequent paper in 2018, which I think won Best Paper Award at ICD that year, uh, what they call adaptive query execution. And the idea is that query shows up, we have the physical plan, we generate the LLM IR, just as we did with regular hyper, but then in, instead of waiting for it to get compiled, then running it, we immediately start interpreting the IR while we compile in the background. And then when the, when the compilation is done, we just slide it in and replace the interpreter with the compiled version of this. And they can do this with morsels, right? Because every, every morsel was a separate task. So when a worker says, all right, I'm done with this morsel, and once we get, get the next one, it goes and looks and see whether the flag that says this compiled query is now available. If it is, then it goes and fetches that and replaces that with the interpreted version. So you can do this seamlessly and, and uh, because you've already broken up the data, the data set you're trying to access into these smaller chunks, you can seamlessly drop in the compiled version and it doesn't break anything. All right? So let's see how this works. So we have a SQL query show up, and these times here I'm showing is from the paper. They show like how much time you're actually spending in these different steps. So a SQL query shows up, you're going to spend 200, uh, or 0 0.2 milliseconds in the, uh, in the optimizer to generate the physical plan. And then you can spend 0 0.7 milliseconds in the, to do the code generated part, to take that physical plan and convert it into LLMIR. To now, at this point, the, the, the execution breaks off into th three branches. The first branch is going to take that LLMIR, and you're going to convert that into some kind of byte code that, that they developed. And you, you're going to do a lightweight comp compilation to that, convert it into, uh, sorry, convert the LLMIR into byte code. And then you have an interpreter for that byte code. Um, the next one, you take the LLVM, convert it to the pass to the LLVM without any optimization, optimization flags, and compile that, and that generates machine code. And then you can again plop that into and replace the the bytecode interpreter at the top. And then you can do more complicated LLVM passes with, you know, to also do the the, you know, the optimization, and you generate the machine code there. So again, if if my query runs in less than a millisecond, then I never even get get to these parts because I just I just did the uh, I just did the bytecode interpretation and I'm immediately done. Now, I remember the paper talks about how uh, they have you know, these. I, I don't remember what the, byte, the paper talks about. They have their own bytecode or whether they're interpreting the LM IR directly. They told me back in the day, before the, before the pandemic, that they, were, they had their own interpreter that they wrote for the LM IR. Thomas wrote it in two weeks because all the open source implementations were, were not good enough for him. He wrote it in two weeks. Uh, and that was good enough. But then the paper talks about how this, they had this later bytecode thing. I actually don't know whether they, they actually implemented that. Um, but we, in our own system, we, we went directly from, in the old Peloton system, we would go directly from LLM IR and then have, we had our own interpreter as well. You don't actually need to implement all of LLVM and in, the instructions to be able to run queries because there's a bunch of things you don't need when you're running SQL statements. So it's, it's, actually, it's actually not as bad as writing every, the entire thing. And again, 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 these are just again additional compilation passes. So another benefit you're going to get from this, uh, again, not from terms of performance, but from terms of software engineering, is that if I needed a bug, you know, a code that's crashing, I can walk through it with the interpreter here, because it's it's going to execute the same things, the same instructions you're going to get when you actually, or well, not instructions, but execute the same logic that you would execute when you actually compile it. So if it crashes here because of some malformed uh, you know, instructions that, that I'm generating up above, then I can walk through the interpreter and figure out what's going on. Again, have to have links to go figure out what, what actually generated that code. But I can walk through the interpreter and, and step through and you know, debug it and figure out what's going on without having to, to look at you know, a, a, a stack or a core dump from you know, a broken query down here. Because again, this is machine generated code, so you're not going to have like a nice a stack trace with, with function names and so forth, you're going to land in an x86 assembly, and you got to go figure out what the hell you're actually looking at, which is not easy to do. So at least in this case here, you would end up with a potentially human readable uh, stack trace. Yes? With the execution, can you actually ship data using 
So he says, with, with, adaptive, with this approach, could you, could you turn on O3 here? Uh, I just, I think there's, I think, I would say, I don't think you, again, I don't think you want to. I think you could, but like, the, yeah, like, it's, how does it is? Like, with O3, I think it's going to reorganize things in a way that you wouldn't do with, with these other two approaches, like with the, like the other two paths, and it, it, you could end up with incorrect results. That's the issue with O3. I think it's too aggressive, and it moves things around, and it should move around. And as long as you're writing safe code, and not undefined well, what, what is safe code, right? Like, not undefined safe. Sure. I, I, look, I, I don't know enough about like, how to make O3 do what you, exactly what you want to do. I don't think Ross handles that either. I, I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm looking at you as if like you're, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, yeah, just don't ship at O3. <laughs> All right, so here's the, uh, here's the performance results on, on TPCH. Again, with the showing, if you just run the entire query, with the different, so th those three paths. And the bytecode, again, it's always going to be the slowest, no surprise there, uh, but it can show you some of the marginal benefits you can get if you actually run with the, the LVM, op op the op the LVM op optimized version of the LVM passes. Right? So I always like to point out Q2. Like, clearly, Q2, it's way faster if you, uh, you, know, if you then run it into, with native machine code, uh, but you're only getting a, you know, a, a five second improvement a five millisecond improvement if you then comp actually compile it. So again, if, if the query runs in, um, in, in, in you know, 20 milliseconds or something like that, this is probably going to be, be better because the time it takes for the compile and get the result back, I I've, I've already completed this. But it's clearly it's faster than the, than the, um, you know, the, 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 the interpreter. All right? Yes? Yeah, so the question is, uh, is it not possible to, well, how hard is it to actually know what the runtime of a query is? For simple things like index lookups, you would know it. For large scans? But I mean, it's, it's, it has to be less than 20 milliseconds, right? So that's a very small margin. Like, there are only a very small set of queries or like a very small set of things you could do within 20 milliseconds, right? There's only a small, very small number of things you can do. There's only so much you can process in 20 milliseconds. Yes. Before, right? So it's not like you have to work out cost estimation for like a very large, complex query. It'll only be for a very small set of queries, right? I mean, so are you saying that like, you're basically saying, could you use a simple heuristic to decide whether you even need to fire this thing off? Yeah. Uh, I suppose you could, yes. Um, Query process, ex uh, query progress estimation, and like query runtime estimation is like a super hard problem. It's like old problem in databases. Uh, heuristics will probably get you most of the way there. I would say also too that like going back to, to this, again for this approach, they're doing they're compiling the entire query. So you, so if an and for another query to show up to be able to reuse the cache plan, it has had, has to have the exact same sort of structure. In the case of Redshift. They'll break up the query into like fragments or segments, they call them, and they cache those. So now if my query shows up, it may not look like any other query I've seen before, but the actual physical plan contains parts of that I've seen before, and I can reuse those and stitch those, stitch those together. So in that case, like, they're not even going to have these extra passes. Uh, they're, they're always going to compile, but like, that compilation cost will be super low because they can go fetch a cache versions of, of them. So going back to your original example here, yeah, I think you would use simple heuristics to say, okay, do I, do I still need this? They talk about how you could then, even if, you, if it completes before the, 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 the expensive compilation finishes, you cache that and can reuse it. But then the question is, is, the point I was trying to make is like, unless the exact same query shows up, the exact same physical plan, you're not going to get any benefit from that because you're not going to be able to reuse that. Redshift handles that by breaking it up. Okay. Right, so I understand again, the high level idea what we're trying to do here is query plan shows up, we, uh, we generate this element in the IR, and then we can either interpret it, uh, do a cheap compilation pass and put it in machine code, or do an expensive one. 
And if the query is still running, by the time I finish the, the cheap compilation pass, then I'll f maybe I'll fire off the, the expensive one. And again, this is different than the, uh, than the Haiku approach, which I'm generating C++ code, and this, just telling GCC to compile it entirely. All right, so I want to go through a bunch of different systems that implement uh, these, uh, these approaches. And I've loosely categorized them into what I'll call sort of custom implementations that are all doing something slightly different. Um, and then there'll be ones based on the JVM that are going to be very similar to what, the, what these guys are doing. It just The main takeaway is they're generating the bytecode directly to for the JVM bytecode and letting the JVM do whatever just-in-time compilation stuff it wants on that. And then I'll have other ones based on LLVM. And then the tombstone means that these, are, these systems are defunct. We've already, so we, we've killed two systems here at CMU. Not proud of it, but it, it, it happens. OK. So uh, as I said in the beginning, IBM, all this IBM invented in 1976. Uh, the background of system art is fascinating. Uh, they took Ted Codd's paper, got a bunch of really smart people in a single room, said, hey, you guys build this. There were all a bunch of people with brand new PhDs, um, some in computer science, some in math, because computer science PhDs was, wasn't as common as just now. Um, and basically, all the people with PhDs took one piece of the system and went and, and built it. Right? Two guys went and built SQL. Another guy go built uh, you know, the, the, the locking stuff, concurrency control. And Pat Salinger went and built off the, the cost-based query optimization. And somebody worked and built the, the, the code generator, the compiler for the, for, for, for the engine. Right? And so in the paper here, this is from the, this, there's a retrospective looking back on the system art project which from 1981, so the paper's already old, but by then they're looking back and Sysmar was old too. Um, and they talk about how like, they figured out that this guy figured out that, oh, you could generate, uh, for a SQL statement, generate assembly code in, in, in IBM uh, 370, System 370 machine language, and have that be broken up into small little fragments, and Redshift will call, the, call these segments. And you stitch these things together and you run that instead of actually having to interpret the plan. And again, they were doing this back in the day because the machines were super underpowered and have really limited memory. So interpreting the, the tree thing that I showed before would be way expensive for them. And then and machines got better, uh, and people need, need to you know, debug things and maintain these things. This approach went out of vogue. But now we're back around again to, to redoing what they've done, because we're just trying to squeak out the best performance we can in, in modern hardware. Right? So again, they take a SQL statement, to take a physical plan, convert it to assembly code, uh, and then could, again, stitch these things together. But IBM is going to abandon this in the early 1980s when they started building SQL DS and DB2. So SQL DS is actually the first commercial relational database system that they put out. Uh, DB2 came out a few years later. And they used bits and pieces of System R, but the thing they didn't carry over from System R was this code gen stuff. Right? And in the, in the retrospectives, they talk about how it, it turned out to be really expensive to execute th these, these code generated plans because you had all these function calls to these, these segments. Uh, and every single time that you wanted to go convert the, the data system to run on some new IBM mainframe, it had this new OS, a new ISA, or new assembly language, you had to port all that, rewrite all that, that, that code gen code. Um, and that, that was a huge pain in the ass for them. So, and also, too, now, every single time as you were building the system, if now the code gen code assumed data was laid out a certain way because they were accessing the, the you know, data pages directly, Every single time you change the, the contents of a data page of the, of the layout, you had to go then change the code gen code because it had made certain assumptions. So from their perspective, this was a, a engin software engineering nightmare, and they, and they discarded this. So Actium Vector, also previously known as Vectorwise, uh, again, which came out of the, 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 the CWI group at where they built MoonADB. Um, and then Marcin built this, and he went up, then went off and went and built uh, Snowflake. But the idea here is that instead of having to do just-in-time compilation for predicates, they're going to say, well, there's only so many predicates you could possibly have. Like integer less than this number, you know, integer less than an integer, float greater than a float. There's only so many of those combinations. So instead what the data system is going to do is uh, just pre-generate all these possible evaluations you want, you want to do to these separate functions. And then when you compile the database system itself, like when you actually ship the binary, you compile all these existing, all these pre-generated predicates. Then at runtime, when you want to, uh, when you want to run a query, instead of again code-generating on the fly, 
You say, oh, you want to compare two integers, you need less than this, greater than that. I have the function that does that. Let me make a function call to that thing and, and use that instead. And then, of course, obviously, this would be expensive. You're doing it on a per tuple by basis, per tuple by tuple. Uh, so you want to rely on uh, auto vectorization or, or vectorized instructions to be able to patch in batch of tuples to amortize that, that function lookup cost. Right? So it sort of looked like this. Say I want to have a, I have a query that says I want to compare two integers. Is one integer less than another integer? Right? Or I want to say, is, is, is a, this double less than another double? Right? So here you can see I'm passing in the, 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 the value that, that's in my, my predicate. Like, is this thing less than this? And then I'm passing in a, uh, a, you know, a pointer to a, to a 32 bit integer column. And then, I, and then I know how to do comparison to this. Right? So again, you pre generate everything, compile it. It's, all, it's in the binder that ships with this database system. And then you just, you just stitch these things together. The, actually, we're not going to read this paper, but like, one of the things they do here in, the, in this paper is I don't think it's actually ever shipped in the real version of VectorWise. They will try different versions or compiler flags to, to these different functions. And then they try to figure out which, which variation of the machine code for this function here is the fastest like, on the fly. Okay, it, it never made it to the real, to commercial version as far as I know. But like, there's a bunch of other things you can do to try to speed this thing up. All right, Redshift, as we talked about before, um, their basic idea is they're going to take a query plan, break it up into fragments, essentially looking like the, the, the segments or the pipelines, the stuff we saw before. Um, and then they're going to convert that into templated C++ code. But before they do that, they want to then figure out, uh, does this, the fragment I need to compile, does this actually already exist in my, my, my cache for, for, for a customer, for, for a local database? So you go look to see, I want to, I want to compile this code because that's the expensive part. Does this already exist in my cache? If yes, I can reuse it. If no, then I compile it and then put it in my cache. What's really fascinating about this is that, and it's a much different uh, perspective of, of the world of databases compared to the hyper guys, is that Amazon will actually reuse compiled segments or query plan fragments across the entire fleet of databases. So, that, so in hyper, it's, it's, everything's running on a single node. Um, so even if you had a query cache or these, these compiled plans, on, on another node, it doesn't know about it, so it can't reuse it. But in the cloud, since the Amazon controls everything, they can have a giant catalog of every possible query plan that's ever existed. They have a cache of everything. So what's, what's fascinating about this is that my query shows up. I've never, I've never executed this query before, but it's going to have basically bits and pieces that look very similar to other queries, even though it's on other, other tables from other customers. And I just go ahead and, and reuse their compiled version. Do they ever have like a cache in this in their global space? Yeah, so I think they said, uh, I think their cache hit rate is like 99.95%. Right? Is that the best there is? The best there is? Uh. <laughs> you can't say anything. Yeah. OK, yeah. Worked on this. Um, so uh, I think it's like 85% like hit rate for the local cache, and then 99.95% hit rate on the global cache. But you shove them out to the to the global cache or the local caches? Um, no, but it, so it's, it's, yeah. So so, but your her, her internship project was working on this piece. But yours is like if I upgrade the version of Postgres. Yeah. Because uh, again, Redshift runs on Postgres. It's, it's a fork of Postgres called Park. So, but like if I upgrade the version, then I, get, I have to regenerate all these cache query plans. So every time there was there was a version bump, I wrote a thing that would then just go pre-generate all the cache cache query plans that they had before, and then push that out to the to to everyone. Right? Again, I find this fascinating. Again, we, you know, we, we're not talking about distributed databases in this class yet. We're still focused on like, what happens on a single node. Uh, but like, beyond even just distributed databases, look if I have all the databases, all the queries. You, you, know, you can leverage that and reuse that across customers. And again, it's not like there's anything proprietary in the query plan that they're generating. Like, if my table has bank information but I, and I have, I have a float column, and your table has uh, I don't know, sensor data and it has a temperature column that's afloat. 
to do a predicate on two floats for my table versus your table, at the end of the day, the instructions are exactly the same. So there's no confidentiality or no, no proprietary information that you're, you're leaking from one customer to the next because the data system just sees data. It doesn't care what's actually in it. Anyway, so uh, April Cladis will come and give a talk. He's, a, he's a, one of the lead people at, at Redshift, CMU Database Group alum. He did his PhD or, uh, over a decade ago, but he'll come at the end of the semester and talk more about Redshift. So we're not going to read a Redshift paper because he'll come and talk about it at, at the end of the semester. All right, Oracle, um, as far as I know, again, at least, I don't think in any of the newer versions, they have, they have a bunch of these accelerators. I still don't think they're doing any uh, uh, code generation or query compilation. The only thing as I think they, they can do is that if you have a UDF in PL SQL, you know, it's the, it's, it basically looks like what's in the SQL standard, how you define procedural code in, in, uh, in functions like UDFs. Um, so if you write a UDF in, in PL SQL, they'll convert that into ProStar C, which is their dialect, restricted dialect of C, and then they'll compile that into to, to native SQL code they can, they can then link in. Think of this as ways, like it's a way to prevent people from, from messing around the, the address space of the, of, of the DB system. Because right? you don't, again, you don't take arbitrary C code and have someone start scribbling into memory, because then you, you could crash the DB system and it could corrupt your database. Prior to that, one thing they were doing also too is when they were still shipping Spark trips about a decade ago or so, um, they would put they would put specific instructions for common database operations like compression, decompression, and memory scans inside the, the hardware itself. So now, say, is that code generation? Well, I'm, it's even better because like it, it's in the silicon, right? Uh, they don't that they don't ship that anymore. Um, so it doesn't you know. This just doesn't exist. All right, uh, with Hecaton, as I talked about, they were trying to build a in-memory uh, sort of accelerated query engine to do transactions, and they would have it run alongside the regular table engine, the execution engine inside of Hecaton. Um, and so what they would do is they would compile both store procedures and uh, SQL into uh, C code, um, and then they would compile that into a shared object or DLL, and then link it at runtime. But what was really cool about this was like they would um, they would uh, you allow the to mix the t the in your, in your hecaton program when you're running one of these compiled queries. You can mix in data from the in-memory row store of hecaton plus the regular table data in the regular SQL, uh, SQL server. And the paper they talks about how they do do a bunch of extra stuff when they generate the C code to make sure that nobody's putting you know buffer overflow crap in, inside your SQL statement that causes it to generate C code that causes uh, security issues. Again, this is OLTP, not OLAP. It's just, just worth mentioning. SQLite is probably the most uh, widely used, or it is a widely used data system. So like, they're doing code generation, uh, and, but most people don't know this. Because um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an embedded data system, but it has its own VM, which is pretty fascinating. So they have a query plan that shows up. Uh, they're going to generate into their own native op codes. Uh, and then they have their own virtual machine called the Virtual Database Engine, the VDB, or the Bytecode Engine, uh, that can then execute the instructions for, that it generates to these opcodes. Um, so when you call explain on SQLite, instead of getting a query plan tree like you normally would in Postgres or other data systems, you're going to get something that looks like this, which is basically here's, all the, address, here's the address of the, the program, and here's the opcodes, and then here's the inputs, and then here's what it's actually doing. So for select 1 plus 1, they generate a program and then actually execute it. Um, and what this allows you to do is that now I can make sure that the VM, all I have to make sure is that the VM implementation of these opcodes works in whatever environment I'm trying to run on. Like I'm trying to run on like a new cell phone or a new, new CPU. Uh, I just need to make sure that, that the VM works and not worry about the rest of the parts of the system. There's a, there's a, there's a file system layer to care about because you've talked with the OS. But in terms of just query execution, all I have to do is implement these opcodes and I can port SQLite to anything. We talked to him a while ago, but like, could you could you bake this into like an FPGA, uh, and, and have like you know hardware acceleration for that? And he said he, this this stuff changes like from one version to the next, that it, it's, and it's not meant to be backwards compatible because it's it's really meant to, he wants to hide this from from the end user, right? That they're actually, he's actually using this VM. I would argue if you, if if you if you call explain and you see this, you're not really hiding it because if you want to get the actual query plan, you have to like it's called explain plan. Whatever, Richard's a good guy. So he, I'm sure you thought this, though. 
All right, so there's a follow-up paper to, uh, to the hyper one you read. There's the adaptive execution one I mentioned about, but then there's a newer version of, of their query uh, compilation engine in Ombra. And again, there's this, I struggle with like, okay, should I have you read the latest paper or the original paper that's the seminal one? So, you know, maybe in future years I'll have students read this. But basically, they, they built a new compilation framework, code generation framework called Flying Start in Umbra, which is the, it's the successor to Umbra, or sorry, successor to Hyper. Um, and instead of having it generate LLM IR, uh, they're, they're going to generate their own IR that looks very similar to LLVM stuff. But then instead of going to like a bytecode and interpreting that, they say, screw all that. Let me just go to immediately from my, the IR directly to x86 assembly. And then you run the assembler on that, which is, which is super fast, super cheap. And then I still can do that adaptive execution in the background where I'll com convert, compile the, the IR into machine code. But most of the time, you can get by just running <laughs> assembly. Right? So this paper is insane because they talk about, oh, yeah, you need this, you need this, you need dead code elimination, and, and, and this. Like, they're basically a built a home compiler inside the database system to generate uh, optimized x86 code. Right? So not only is this dude, like, it's insane. Not only are they like, amazing at databases, they're also like, building a compiler, too. It's, I don't have to pee. All right, so this table here just shows you, like, on, on, the, on, the, on the x-axis, they have compilation time, and the y-axis, they have execution time, and just showing you that, like, you know, with, with the, the flying start approach, you can get the low compilation time and reasonable execution performance because you're generating x86 assembly. But if you really want to squeak out the best performance, you know, you pay the penalty to, to compile it to, you know, with, with LLVM. All right? So again, this is the state of our approach of how you do code generation in a database system. You generate x86 directly. Uh, the, but again, I would say my only critique of this would be it's a single, it's a, it's a, you know, single node view to the world of databases. In the Redshift approach, you don't need any of this because you have the giant query cache that has every possible query you could ever execute or every fragment you could ever possibly execute. If you're trying to run on a single node as fast as possible and you can't reuse stuff from other queries or, or in the past, then you would, you would want to do something like this. I would say, again, it's a very small segment of the world of people who actually can build a data system and also build a compiler that generates x86 assembly. And that's the Germans. OK, so uh, Apache, so now we're getting to the, the JVM stuff. So Apache Spark uh, originally was written in Scala, and they, would, they weren't doing uh, code generation. They would, they would do interpretation, just like a, any traditional system would. But then in 2015, they introduced this new tungsten engine um, where they would convert the where clause, the expression trees, into Scala ASTs. And then they would con convert those ASTs directly into J the JVM bytecode. And then they execute it na natively in the JVM. And it's up to the JVM, excuse me, it's up to the JVM, JVM hotspot, hotspot compiler to decide, should I compile this, this bytecode or not? Right? But once they get into that bytecode, they let the JVM handle that. So in the well, we later in the semester, the newer paper from Databricks in their new Photon engine, um, they abandoned this approach because they don't want to have use any of the JVM at all for, for the, sort of the, the, the hot path of query execution. Right? Use JVM for all the, the front end stuff, but like when you actually execute queries, you want to use, you know, you want, you want to use C++ code. Um, but another the other challenge they faced also is too is that they, were, they found for, for complex queries, they were generating uh, they were generating uh, giant query plans that that uh, that exceeded the limit of how big J the JVM will, will let you generate, you know, uh, generate dynamic code. Uh, and so they would oftentimes crash because the query would show up, and they they try to generate code for it, and they could run fast, but it would be too big, and therefore they had to roll back and use the interpreted plan. So with Photon, they actually don't do any code generation; they only do vectorization. And they do sort of like the vectorized tricks so of like having some stuff pre-compiled ahead of time, and then stitching that together. In terms of Java databases that are doing something similar, instead of with, with Scala, uh, you know, there's a bunch of these here: Neo4j, Splice Machine. This was founded by a uh, CMU alum. He's actually on the he's on the advisory board for SCS's trustees or something like that. All right, so that this was like HBase plus plus Spark stitched together. That failed. Uh, Presser and Trino do something like this, and then Apache Derby as well. And again, it's all basically the same approach as Hyper, but again, and, and Spark instead of generating the LMR. IR, you're generating the JVM bytecode. All right, so single store, formerly known as MemSQL, uh, they actually had two iterations of their execution engine. 
uh, that was doing code generation. Um, and so I want to talk about the first one and then and how, you know, then they hit the same problems that we, that, that we talked about. And then they rewrote it into a newer version that looks very similar to what Hyper did uh, and what we do uh, and, and our old system. So the first version of MemSQL prior to 2016 uh, is that they would, query plan shows up and they would generate C++ code just like the Haiku did. And then they fork exec GCC. And of course now fork exec and GCC is really expensive. So they wanted to use cache plans as much as possible. But their caching was quite limited. Right? So they would convert any query plan that shows up, they pull out the constants, and they would replace it with a parameterized SQL string and compile that so that someone else comes along with basically the exact same SQL query, but with a different input parameter, they could reuse it. Right? And the reason why they, they decided to go this approach is because they saw one of the founders of, of MemSQL, a single store, was at Microsoft working on SQL Server when they were building Hecaton and saw all the internal talks from the, the, the Hecaton team saying, this is how we're going to do code generation. But they were using, uh, Microsoft was using a more sophisticated approach and it was using the, the CLR running in, you know, running in SQL Server. So this is like a poor man's approach to, to replicate what they, what they were doing. So again, now if I show up with another query that says, you know, where parameter equals a.id, unless they do any normalization, the, the, the signature or the fingerprint of this, the SQL string wouldn't match, so you couldn't reuse the cache plan. So then in 2016 or 2015, they hired away the guy that built the hip hop VM at, at Facebook, right? Facebook famously runs on PHP, PHP is slow. So this guy built a compiler for it called hip hop. So they hired him away to go build the new compiled version of, of MemSQL single store. And it looks a lot like the, very similar to the, to the, the adaptive execution approach that Hyper had generated. Where instead of going directly from, uh, to mach you know, from, from, from machine code, sorry, from element IR to, to compile ex executable, you could have different stages. You could have an interpreter and, and then a uh, compiled version of this. So query plan shows up. They're going to generate this into a, an internal language, a dialect called the MPL, the, the, the MemSQL programming language. And then they convert this DSL into their own custom opcodes, like SQLite. Then they could either interpret that or then compile it, right? And I don't have performance numbers to show here, but like it was, it was a, uh, it was, uh, it was pretty significant. That, again, but from a software engineering perspective, you know, they only had to have like the top dude, top small team build the actual interpreter and the executable code or the compiler part, and everyone else could work on just the, you know, the high-level MPL programming language. Or the, the, there's like, you know, the JavaScript programmers, you don't let touch this. Then there's like the good systems programmers that like, okay, they can maybe write this. And then like the guys on cocaine or whatever, they, they write this bottom part here. <laughs> All right, uh, Postgres in 2018 added support to do just-time compilation. Uh, so I think it, they shifted in 2018, sorry, they shifted it in version 11, but it wasn't turned on by default. And then in version 12, that came out a year later, then it's turned on by default. And again, the only thing that they're compiling here are the, uh, are the expressions and the where clauses. They're not doing the holistic query compilation that, that we saw in Hyper and other systems. And basically, there's a bunch of flags that you can pass in to, and tune in, uh, in, um, in Postgres to say, if the, if, if the optimizer thinks the query is going to take this long, don't compile it or do compile it. I think it's like, I don't think you can start running the query and then decide after the fact I want to compile it. They have to make the decision when the query shows up. And there's flags that allow you to specify uh, how aggressive it is in just making that decision. Uh, the test DB, or is it Vitisa DB? There's the test and Vitisa. I forget which one is which. One of them is, is, a, is a sharded version of MySQL. It came out of YouTube. And then there's Vitisa DB. And this is a fork of, of Greenplum. So they, they try to do complete, uh, they do more, much more aggressive query compilation over, over, uh, over Postgres. Again, they were doing this before Postgres added the, the, the JIT, JIT stuff. So basically, a query shows up, and they can identify whether this is something that the, green, the, the Vitesse, Vitesse engine can support, and they, they go down that code path, and they can compile things and, and run that more, more quickly. And they do a bunch of the techniques that we've, we've talked about so far. All right, so I'll quickly talk about, last, but the two systems we were building at CBU and the challenges that we faced. And then we threw away the code, and, and not because of these challenges, just because uh, but it's good to sort of see how the, the, the other systems have, we talked about a couple of ways the other systems have got around these problems. And we were a small ragtag team of academics that we didn't have the, 
you know, we didn't have all the money that like Databricks had to have a large team to build these things or whatever, whatever company. Um, so we had to make do with what we had. And we, didn't, we, didn't have, we only had one German. Um, <laughs> but he had, and he went back, he works on Hyper now uh, in Germany. Anyway, um, so the, the first version of Peloton, we were doing a full compilation of going, we had C++ macros that generate the IR, and then we would, we would, we would execute that, you know, compile that and execute that directly. And then we were using that rela relaxed operator fusion stuff we talked about before, or uh, in the paper, last paper that was the materialization approach. We had these stage buffers where we could store a bunch of tuples there and then iterate over those tuples and do that in a vectorized manner. Um, and we used software prefetching to hide the stalls. So this is the graph I think I showed before, just showing you that the, you know, the interpret engine was always awful. Uh, but then for compilation, in some cases, it, 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 compilation always made a big difference, but whether or not you Got the, you took full advantage of vectorization dependent on, on the query. Like so for this query here, doing the, the this here, it's, it's just a you know scan with a line item with a bunch of aggregates. There were, you didn't get really a lot of benefit from aggregation there, but for the other ones, it did make a difference. But the problem with this one is that, as I was sort of saying before, like the the the, the number of students I have could, that could work on the actual compilation side of this thing, the, the Davis engine, was pretty small. Right, it was my PhD student, Prashant, who now works on Photon at Databricks, the, the German guy that showed up, and then like one or two other students. One of them is a PhD student. Actually, they're both PhD students at MIT now. Right, so uh, it made it really challenging, challenging to have students build out new functionality in the, in the execution engine because you had to understand the element IR, had to understand compilers, and plus you had to understand, understand databases. So when we, when, when we started over and started building noise page, we switched to this, the, the MemSQL single store style approach where we could take our query plan, generate our own uh, DSL. If you have uh, poked around in the, the CMUDB GitHub repositories, there's something called like TPL or Terrier. That's the name of my dog. We named it the programming language after my dog because we, we didn't know what else to call it. Um, but we would generate this, this DSL, and then, we, then you could compile that DSL into opcodes, and then there was an interpreter you could step through it and watch and see how it would actually execute that opcodes. And the benefit of this is that the opcodes would basically execute the same pass in the system as the compiled version did. So again, if, if there was a bug in the compiled version, you could at least walk through the interpreter and, and figure out what happened. So here's a really simple example of what it looked like. Query shows up, and it would generate this DSL like this. Again, this is a pseudo language. It's, 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 it's specific to the data system. The, you know, there wasn't actually, you know, there wasn't a, how's this? He made design choices in this uh, of how he defined the syntax to make it easier to do compilation and interpretation later on to bytecodes, right? So it sort of looks like C, but it's not exactly the exact same thing. And then uh, you would generate this, this huge uh, opcode uh, program, which you would then either do have an interpreter and step through it or run it through LVM and compile it, just, just like in the case of, uh, uh, of Hyper. And then when we switched to this approach, it increased the number of students that actually could work on the execution part of the system. Uh, and we had other challenges, like we didn't have a good query optimizer that, that caused us to have problems. Um, and this is why we threw away the noise-based source code. Plus, the pan pandemic didn't help either. All right, I am way over time. Uh, so I know we wanted to get to Project 3 stuff. We'll have to pick up that up next class. But <laughs> sorry, uh, but the slides are online. You can start seeing things. All right, um, so query compilation makes a huge difference, but it's not easy to implement this. And this is why the uh, the most of the systems are going to choose vectorization. And in the cases where they don't do holistic qu query compilation, they'll just do predicate co compilation, or the expression tree compilation stuff. This is 2016 MemSQL is probably the best, this is a single store, it's probably the best uh, query compilation Im implementation right now in terms of both performance and the actual, like, uh, how to say this, and, this and, and the software engineering side of things. I think obviously the Umbra stuff is amazing, but like to actually implement that is like it's super hard. Whereas this one, it's hard, but like it's it's in the grasp of again, if, if we could do it here in, in the U.S. with only one German, then like I think other companies could do the same thing. And so any new system that has to come out now, whether or not using vectoriz vectorized execution or not, or a compilation or not, you have to get the same performance as if you were doing holistic query compilation. And there's ways to do that in like the vectorized approach. We can pre-compile things and stitch it together. That can get you the, the get you most of the way there. Okay. All right. So next class, we'll go over Project Three. 
uh, topics, but then the paper you guys are signed reading is a comparison between the vectorization approach and the compilation approach. And understand like one when is one better than another. Okay? All right, guys. See ya. <laughs> That's my favorite all <laughs> What is it? Yes. It's the S T Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cuff say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Quick the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case on the board. Six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say fruit makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>